Hello there and welcome back to video number three in which we'll be looking at um, brachiopods some more, what they look like in rocks and thin sections, and of course why they're useful to us as geologists. So without further ado, let's start by looking at some brachiopods in a rock. And I'm pleased to report that brachiopods in a rock look like brachiopods in a rock. So uh, I guess uh, a general point here is that um, rocks often have shelly materials. Um, those are uh, often found in differing amounts of fragmentation. And in order to be able to tell a brachiopod from a bivalve, those fragments have to be big enough to see the symmetry. If the um, fragments are big enough to see the symmetry of the shell, then really it's quite easy to tell them apart from bivalves. See this example here of a uh, kind of lingulid-like brachiopods. It's really quite clear that they you're looking at a brachiopod there. If you've got small fragments, it may be a lot harder, although the thin sections, as we'll see in the next slide, uh, can help us. The other thing I wanted to highlight um, at this point is that the, um, the brachiopods often uh, form concentration beds. They were so abundant and successful that in places they can comprise the primary component of a rock. I've put some examples of concentration beds on this slide for you here, both on the left here and on the right. And you can see that sometimes when you find brachiopods in Paleozoic rocks, um, they really are a, a major component of the rock itself, and they're very easily recognisable as such. So that's really good, that's useful. Uh, they are useful things to have in Paleozoic field areas. As I mentioned, sometimes it can be hard to uh, tell um, bivalve from brachiopod fragments apart in a hand specimen if you're looking at just thin slivers of a rock of, uh, of one of these, or if you've um, knocked open the rock and all you see is a cross section of the shell. You can't always see the symmetry very easily in that situation. Um, these, this slide shows examples of brachiopod shells within slides, and they're normally relatively easy to tell apart from bivalves under this um, uh, in, in a slide because they will often show the shell microstructure. Um, so this is really quite clear in thin section. You've got this fibrous structure, which you can see very clearly on this example here. Now, obviously, if they've been recrystallized, then that may not be present. You may not be able to, to see that. Often, you'll be able to see this very distinctive fibrous pattern. You'll be able to say that right there is a brachiopod shell. In cross-polarized light here, you can see some phosphatization of this shell. And also, you can see some nice, interesting um, micro-boring uh, structures on this shell here. So these are traces of predatory organisms on that original shell. So actually, within, within these, the different groups of brachiopods, there are some really um, quite strong differences in um, shell microstructure, which you can learn about by reading the uh, text I've recommended for this course. Um, and that's also visible in, um, in thin section if the shell has not been, for example, recrystallized. So that's another reason why slides are useful with brachiopods. So that's what these fossils look like. And I wanted to finish today's lecture on this, this third video by highlighting why brachiopods are useful to us as geologists. Now I mentioned to the th in the um, in the first video that um, to us in kind of any kind of sense by which we utilize them in the modern world as a food source or as a source of luxury goods or anything like that, brachiopods are not so useful to us as human beings because we don't tend to use them because there aren't that many of them around. However, I don't want to give um, brachiopods too short a shrift because actually um, they are really useful to us as geologists in particular, particularly in terms of talking about research questions. Because they were so abundant and successful, they have been used over the years uh, of human scientific endeavor to study macroevolution, which I've represented here with a picture of a young uh, Alfred Russell Wallace and a young Charles Darwin. So they're really interesting from a science perspective, and they're really useful for, in particular, geological research. So as geologists, we really should care about them. For example, if we focus on the essential biological requirements for what uh, an individual brachiopod needs to survive, we can couple that with studies of diversity over time and identify whether changes in brachiopod diversity are driven by extrinsic causes. So these are things like changes in the environment or changes in ecology, or whether there are intrinsic changes um, 
are happening, such as um, changes in the development and physiological and physiology of these animals causing evolutionary changes. So if you're interested in evolution in deep time, because we've got so many brachiopods from such a long period of the Paleozoic, we can use them to try and untangle the potential causes of the patterns that we're seeing in an evolutionary sense. I would highlight now that because they are not always widespread, um, when brachiopods are used for biostratigraphy, as we've been talking about some of the other lectures, this is typically done on a regional scale and this is limited to a regional scale. They are generally not particularly valuable to us as, um, as other fossils are, as index fossils on a global scale, because they are not so widespread. Though there are some exceptions to that during the Silurian period. So I'm not going to be, you may be relieved to hear, talking so heavily about biostratigraphy in this why are they useful section. So I just wanted to flag that as a reason um, that brachiopods are not particularly uh, useful to us. So um, uses one, research and um, understanding evolution. Not so good for biostratigraphy. But also, um, they have helped us greatly in kind of geological research. So as a result of their abundance and diversity in the Paleozoic, they are featured in many paleoecological studies of Paleozoic faunas. So if we combine our understanding of the morphology of brachiopods with what we can deduce about their mode of life, um, see the image I've put below this video, um, for how morphology reflects the mode of life, if you're interested. It gives you this quick overview of the different forms and how they probably live their lives. Um, we can use this to study uh, paleoecology and distributions of these different modes of life in deep time. So brachiopods do show this wide range of lifestyles. Many of them are attached by a pedicle or cemented to a hard substrate or rooted into soft sediment. Some groups uh, were capable of um, Class, or had evolved clasping spines to help stabilize their shells, and some groups lost their pedicle, and they thus developed strategies involving inverted pseudo and formal and recumbent modes of life. A few taxa, such as Lingula, the one we've met before, um, developed an informal lifestyle. So that's a quick whiz through these different lifestyles that we, um, we know of, and I wanted to highlight that brachiopods were this vital part of um, benthic, so seafloor, apelli communities. Examples of how we can put all of those together, if, you, if we're experts at brachiopods, are shown on this slide here. So on the left, you can see some work on Silurian brachiopods that suggests that paleo communities were depth related. As such, there is a predictable um, succession of faunas that are characterized by some key brachiopods shown here. So you can go from shallow through to deep and recognize this change in collections of brachiopod species. These collections of species are called assemblages and they form the basis of what we call benthic assemblage zones. These are zones um, typically numbered one to five, which uh, go from intertidal to the edge of the continental slope and then number six, which is, um, is, is abyssal kind of depths. Uh, that can allow us to recognize uh, depth in, in this example, Paleozoic rocks. So that's really useful, right? Being able to tell water depth is a really valuable thing for us. In contrast, studies on Mesozoic brachiopods, as shown in this diagram on the right here, suggest that in those circumstances, um, brachiopod-dominated paleo communities uh, were controlled by substrate so whether you are on a rocky seafloor, say, or in muddy sediments, uh, rather than depth. So actually what we have here is this complex picture. In different ages, brachiopod communities can help us say different things about the rocks. And that's because this is a complex picture. And it's likely that a combination of factors controls the distributions of this group. But nevertheless, by researching them, we can untangle these different factors and then use the brachiopods to help us understand the rocks that we're looking at. So another really nice example of how um, brachiopods are useful to us as geologists is their biogeography. This is looking at the spatial distribution of brachiopods across geological time and, and indeed how that changes. And that can be really useful to us as geologists. 
I've chosen one really cool example, which is their use in studying ocean currents of the past, in particular, the movement and track of ocean currents in the Cretaceous in this example. So today, as you may be aware, we have the Gulf Stream. This is an ocean current which runs out of the Caribbean, up the eastern seaboard of North America, detaching from the coast just north of New York. It then heads across the Atlantic, keeping the waters around Britain and indeed much of Western Europe warmer than we might otherwise expect from our location on the globe. It has a really, really big impact on the climate that we experience. And so an important question is, when did this start? Uh, and how, um, how might we be able to tell? Well, the brachiopods of the Cretaceous age can give us a clue. Uh, early Cretaceous brachiopod faunas from East Greenland represent a mix um, of species from two different ocean provinces. This figure here shows the uh, modern day uh, coastline uh, with the location of these brachiopod faunas. And the brachiopod fauna here uh, has these two mixtures of species from different ocean provinces. These represent both low latitude and high latitude, um, what are called assemblages of, uh, of brachiopods. The high latitude shallow water assemblages occur immediately adjacent to a fauna containing those low latitude elements, which are more typical of deeper water, but also they're kind of exotic and tropical. Now, the only way we can imagine that those two can be placed so close to each other in the um, Cretaceous is that we must have had an early form and a persistent northward track of a proto Gulf Stream current occurring at this time period marked with the red arrows here. So thanks to the brachiopod faunas that were around during this time period, we can actually say something about the ocean currents that were um, occurring on Earth during that time period, uh, which is, I think, considering how long ago it was, very, very um, impressive. And these kind of studies of changing patterns of paleobiogeography through time are critical to understanding both the modern climate and ocean pattern that we have and how it originated. So it's another nice example of how brachiopods are really useful to us as paleontologists. And that indeed brings me, or oh sorry, useful to us as geologists, I suppose I should say. And that brings us to the end of this third video on brachiopods. Um, so please do have a look at those modes of life immediately below uh, this video in the website. And uh, if you've got any questions, I will happily answer them in the Zoom session associated with this and the last website. So I'll see you sometime soon.